Hey, and, and the pizza just arrived, so timing is just excellent. So um, feel free to just get up and get pizza whenever you need it. Um, how many of you have been to the Harvard Forest? That's pathetic. No, that's not enough. Um, I would like to invite you all to come to the Harvard Forest at some point. Um, I will give you a couple of, of opportunities and things for you to think about. In the very, very near future, um, we're having a closing reception for the Hemlock Hospice Project on um, October 20th, which is two Saturdays from now. Um, we'll have some discussions about, we'll have panel discussions about uh, invasive and non-native species and changes in our forest, as well as tours of the installation itself, which is actually up until mid-November, so you can come afterwards too if you want to see it a different time or again. If you are already tied up on Saturday, October 20th, it's from 10 to 4. Um, if you're already tied up then, next Saturday, um, October 13th, the meeting of the New England Botanical Club, um, which happens on usually the first Friday of every month, but this month, it's the second Saturday, and it's going to be at Harvard Forest from 4 o'clock in the afternoon till uh, through dinner and then and then later, I'll be doing a tour of Hemlock Hospice uh, at 4 o'clock. And then I'll be giving a talk in the evening about the science of, of hemlock and hemlock decline in non-native species. Hubbard Forest is about 70 miles to the west of here, right out Route 2. Um, you get off at exit 17, you go south a couple of miles, and you park. We're the only Harvard unit that is free parking. So there's no excuse for you not to come. We've got about 20 miles of trails that are open all year round. And finally, we do have a summer undergraduate research program um, that's an 11-week program. Next summer, it'll start May 28th and run till the second Friday uh, in August. I direct that program and have for the last 15 years. So it's, a, it's an REU program. Uh, we usually support between 25 and 30 students every summer to do uh, mentored undergraduate research. So we encourage you to think about that um, or tell your friends as well. So there's a bunch of reasons to come visit the Harvard Forest. And if that's not enough, I was actually, I was out driving yesterday in western Massachusetts. I was all the way out in northwest Massachusetts in Plainfield. The colors are absolutely spectacular. And it's going to be peak in about two weeks. So it should be really excellent. So please come visit us. Um, I'm going to talk today about the Hemlock Hospice Project um, and sort of an elegy to, to hemlocks, the eastern hemlocks. Um, the Hemlock Hospice Project is a uh, mix of landscape ecology, art, and design um, that is a collaborative effort uh, led by, but not completely run by, David Buckley Borden um, and myself. Um, we've had an enormous amount of help from other people working on this as well. We just sort of get the, get the lead credit, as it were. But I'll talk more about that um, over the next 45 minutes or so. Tell you a little bit about each of us to get started. I apologize, David. Um, David and I are working on a new installation in Cambridge uh, for a couple weeks from now, and he took a fall and broke three ribs, so he's not here today. Um, I'm a, a community ecologist. I've been at Harvard Forest for 20 years. I've been working in the field for almost 40 years. I study how ecological systems are organized how they're put together, how they respond to a wide variety of disturbances, both natural disturbances and anthropogenic disturbances, and then how those systems rearrange themselves. And so this photograph is actually from one of my experiments at Harvard Forest, where for the last 15 years we've been looking at how the forest will respond to the loss of a key species, uh, in this case, uh, eastern hemlock. David Buckley Borden is a uh, environmental artist uh, with background in graphic design and landscape architecture. Uh, and his uh, work now is really focused on communicating and presenting important ecological uh, and environmental issues through what he likes to call popular art or ways of design that really grab people visually in ways that are both unexpected um, and appealing. 
We both work at the Harvard Forest. I've been there permanently uh, since since 2001. David uh, came as a as a visiting researcher a couple years ago and is now on uh, on our list as a as a fellow. Harvard Forest uh, was set up as the Har as the forestry school for Harvard University back in 1907 when there was no forest in, or very little forest in New England, and so. If you come to Harvard Forest for nothing else, you should come to see our dioramas, which are the most amazing dioramas anywhere in the world. Um, and this is, this is one of them. Um, and it illustrates what the landscape looked like in about somewhere around 1830, 1840. And it's really hard to imagine when you're out at Harvard Forest now, and the entire landscape for tens, hundreds of miles around us is 70, 80, 90% covered with forest. That, 150 years ago, this landscape was almost completely devoid of forests. Right? Europeans did a really great job. They showed up, they cut it all down, um, and it, we've been watching this forest recover and grow back for a few hundred years. At Harvard Forest, we are no longer a forestry school. We really do ecological research, looking at forest dynamics in an era of climate change. We look at this from the perspective of basic ecology, human interactions filtered through land use, and we do a lot of work with uh, translating the ecological data that we collect into uh, decisional, decisionable science and action that people can actually use in the policy realm. We work quite a lot with policy uh, makers and decision makers throughout New England uh, and elsewhere in the world. We also think about where we're going in the future, and this is day one of David's takes on what the what Western New England might look like sometime in the future. And we can imagine a whole bunch of different scenarios. We can imagine heavily intensified uh, scenarios with a lot of industry, with more high-speed transportation. You have to drive to Harvard Forest. Right now, you can take the train, and it ends at Wachusett, and then you got another half an hour that you got to figure out how to get to. Uh, to Harvard Park. That's half an hour by car, right? So it's a little longer by bike or by foot. Um, we can imagine other futures that are somewhat more sustainable, that have more biodiversity, uh, all sorts of different ways that we can re-envision the, the future of our landscape. And we think about that and work about that at Harvard Park. David and I came together on this project. I met David at an exhibition he did at the Boston Design Center um, down by the waterfront a few years back. I was on my way to a meeting in Germany, and my postdoc said, oh, you have to go check out this exhibition at the Design Center. So I walked into the exhibition um, that was uh, a set of pieces that David had done while he was on a residency in the Adirondacks. And I was walking around, and I was really quite uh, enamored of many of the different um, pieces that, that he had in here and ways that it sort of really sparked attention of how people might think about environmental issues in a way that's a lot more playful, perhaps, from what we normally see in the news. Um, and David was sitting at a table over there, and so he, he walked up to me and we started chatting about it. I said, well, you know, this is, this is just like what we do at Harvard Forest. He said, well, that's no surprise because I used a lot of the Harvard Forest reference material in putting together um, this sort of exhibition and so and these pieces. And so I said, well, you really have to come out to Harvard Forest and visit us, right, and talk to us about what you could do if you were actually on site, knowing in the back of my mind that we have this fellowship program for mid-career researchers, policymakers, artists, um, people who can write compelling proposals to try and get him there um, for a year, which I ended up being able to. Uh, to do. But to give you a sense of how we think about these things, so what do you see here? That is not a rhetorical question, that is a question being asked, which response would be nice. What do you see? A tree. A tree. Yeah, you can read, that's good. What else do you see? Holes. What kind of holes? Woodpecker holes, right? Everyone know their woodpecker holes? Who didn't know they were woodpecker holes? Okay? Lots of people actually have no idea those are woodpecker holes. They see a tree with holes. What do you do with a tree with holes? Some people cut it down, right? 
One, one question I have, right, um, Coco mentioned that I do a lot of photography, and I'm particularly interested in trees with holes and snags and things like that. And I've just moved to Boston, right? I, I lived out in, in Royalston, north of Peterson, for many years, and I take lots of pictures of snags. There aren't any in the city, right? I find that really interesting that there aren't any in the city. And yet they're really important ecologically. And this might be how an ecologist thinks about why snags are important. Now, as an ecologist who used to, doesn't anymore, teach ecology, I look at this diagram and I say, awful, right? First off, it's biologically inaccurate, right? I mean, you've got a monarch caterpillar and a tiger swallowtail butterfly and some kind of random beetle and a yellow jacket and who knows what. These are sort of iconic biodiversity linked together in something that we might call a food web. And this is like out of a middle school textbook, right? This is sort of standard how we think about a food web, which just, it makes me cringe, right? But it also illustrates at the you know, point, you know, the value of dead wood, right, over here. That's, that's good, right? This is sort of David's version of how you think about dead wood, right? And why dead wood is really valuable. And I think that's really great. I actually have one of these up in my, in my apartment out in, in Peter. So, so just trying to communicate ecological principles through accessible art and design is what David does and what we've tried to do in thinking about the Hemlock Hospice Project. So how many of you know what Eastern Hemlock is? Well, that's good. We got, we got a bunch. Eastern hemlock is a big tree. It's a conifer tree. It's, I like to call it the redwood of the east. You all know what redwoods are, right? Yeah, good. right? It's not as big as a redwood, but it's our old growth equivalent. It does the same sort of thing in our systems. We can think of it as a foundation species that defines the community, that knits together the forest type that it's in, that makes for very different kinds of soils, uh, very specific kinds of animals and plants and fungi and bacteria that are associated with hemlocks. And it's, it's got an enormous range. It ranges from Georgia up the Appalachian Mountains into southern Canada, across the upper Midwest to Wisconsin um, and Michigan. It's a really important forest tree. It's an important forest tree ecologically. It actually defines more types of forests in the United States Forest Service classification than any other tree in North America, right? So in terms of types of forest that it defines, it's, it's number one. Economically, it was important. It was the source of tannin for tanning leather um, until synthetic tannins were discovered. Um, good straight timber uh, of hemlock can be used in post and beam construction. Most of that was logged out 150 years ago. Um, culturally, it's really important. There are a whole host of New England poets, from Emily Dickinson and Robert Frost to John Updike, who have written poetry about hemlock. We really care about hemlock in, in the Northeast um, and throughout its range, and it's disappearing. It's disappearing because of this insect, the hemlock woolly adelgid, which is about the size of a poppy seed, and everybody knows how big a poppy seed is. So if you don't, it's about the size of the eyeball on the quarter on George Washington space on the quarter. Um, and it was introduced to the United States, uh, to eastern United States from Japan in the 1950s, and it's been spreading northward. And it looks like this under the, under the, um, the needles of hemlock. It makes little fuzzy masses. Each one of these is an individual adelgid. It breeds. Um, it makes lots more adelgid, and it kills the trees. Um, and it's been doing this for 30, 40, 50 years now, and there's really no way to effectively control this. And so hemlock is going the way that chestnut went, that elm went, that ash is currently going, that beech is going, um, that more species in eastern North America, northeastern North America are under siege from non-native insects. Um, and native insects, fungi, pathogens, and the like than anywhere else in the world. Um, and so this is sort of ground zero for this kind of forest change. In responses, and I've been studying how are these forests, these hemlock forests changed since I came to the Harvard Forest, um, both observationally and experimentally. 
in response to this and as a way to get people thinking about hemlock decline in our changing forests in a different way, we created the Hemlock Hospice um, exhibition, which at one level is simply um, a mile-long, in-out interpretive trail with 18 sculptural pieces, um, starting at the Fisher Museum on, as I mentioned, Route 32, if you come in for off exit 17. Um, and we it, we it opened, we installed it in October, we finished and opened it in October last year, and it'll be up till the middle of November this year. It's also a way for us to prompt people to think about their forests differently. So where we cited Hemlock Hospice is along a natural history trail at Harvard Forest that for many years was the most frequently used trail at Harvard Forest, both by researchers, um, visitors, student groups, local residents. We get thousands of people a year. There are many people who come to the forest every day. They ride their horses, they walk their dogs, they go for uh, uh, just a walk in the forest. This was sort of the number one trail, and we had to close it about seven years ago now because the hemlocks are all falling apart. Um, and the insurance folks and the admin folks say this becomes a liability, and you can't have people walking on a trail where people are going to have things fall on their head. And so the very first piece um, in the Hemlock Hospice exhibition is a very simple trail barrier that says, trail's closed, go somewhere else, right? And this is a prompt for people to say, hey, something I've walked every day, every day I walk down this trail and every day I turn left and now I can't turn left anymore. So now I have to think differently about what this forest is like. And if they don't get it the first time, because everyone just walks around the barrier, right? Um, they get it the second time when they run into the big piece behind it and they can't walk into it. The, the trail is set up as a narrative about how the, how the Adelgid came to North America, what we're trying to do about it, and how the forests are changing. And they also contextualize how what's going on in New England at Harvard Forest with the Hemlock and the Adelgid throughout its range with the Hemlock and the Adelgid throughout New England with trees and other species changing in their abundance and disappearing. This is a part of a big global picture. You all know this, right? You all know that climate is changing, that the, the Earth's environment is changing. And what we see at Harvard Forest with the hemlock decline is a microcosm of this. And for many audiences, when you talk to people about climate change, when you talk to people about environmental change, bringing it right home to them is, can be very effective, right? It's a lot easier to talk about what's going on in your backyard to your property um, and get people thinking about that than it is thinking about something that's, say, related to a giant hurricane somewhere else. provides opportunities in many different ways for education, for communication, for illustrating collaboration. This particular uh, set of hard hats that we have up at the sort of main entrance to Hemlock Hospice sort of grabs all three of these all at once. It gets people putting on field gear. All of us wear these in the forest because we don't want branches falling on our heads and knocking us out. Um, recognizing, of course, that really all a hard hat does for you when a tree falls on you is still allows you to have an open casket funeral. Um, it also it provides an op provided an opportunity for us to recognize the many different collaborators on the project. Many of the different um, artists who worked with us each got to design one of their own uh, hard hats for the for the exhibition. Um, when we think about putting together an exhibition like this, how many of you would think of yourselves as artists or science communicators? Okay, so we got some of those. How many of you think of yourselves as hardcore scientists, data geeks? Okay, so we got some of those. Um, when I have my science hat on and I write a grant proposal, one of the big chunks of my grant proposal is broader impact. I've got to get the word out and get people thinking about it. 
And one of the easiest ways for me to do that is to find an artist and say, hey, I can, you know, can you help me, right? I'll give you some data. You turn it into a project and send it out there. Then art has taken the science and maybe a little bit of design and they've created a product. As a scientist, I don't have to think about it anymore. The artist has done their job. They've, they've you know, communicated this out to the rest of the world. They're sort of the tip of the communication spear here. And as a scientist, and even many artists that, that we know, this is sort of how we think about this, this sort of practice. It's a, it's a hierarchy founded on the science and the data, right? And uh, then you design something, whether it's visual art or uh, written art or video or whatever, that gets pushed out. That goes to the broader world. And when I write a proposal, this is sort of what I think about, right? At the same time, there's a lot more stuff that goes into, into this, right? It's not just enough to say, yeah, we're going to do this. You got to talk about things. You got some publicity. You got to have some programming. You got to have a message. You might want to have some actionable items that you do. Um, you need a whole community of people behind you um, making this happen, as well as a whole community of people in front of you that you want to reach. And you have to really feel deep down about your subject. This is no, this is, there's, there's, this is a, a big step away from sort of standard scientific objectivity. And so for the rest of what I'm going to talk about today, I want to focus on three of these pieces on the science, the empathy, and the community. We'll come back to some of these other pieces at the end that, that may be particularly interesting to those of you who work in the art and design world about some of the challenges and solutions that, that we encountered putting this sort of thing together. But I want to start by talking about the community, the empathy, and the science. And it's really easy when we talk about community to sort of, I mean, we have greenwashing in, 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 in the environment where anyone can say they're sort of organic and environmental and healthy and green. We have the same thing in the art world with community. It's like, oh yeah, we engage community. Good. Done, been there, done that. Um, we try to do a little better than that. Um, we recognized in putting this together that, first off, there's not just a community. We actually have a lot of communities that we're working with really deeply and creatively throughout this. First off, we're at Harvard Forest. I work there. David was um, on, in residence there for, for a year. We have a mission at Harvard Forest to do science, education, research, outreach, that involves people and nature. We want anything that we do at Harvard Forest, whether it's our science, whether it's a, a sculptural in installation, to reflect this mission. So every time we're sitting down to do something to create a new piece, we reflect, does this accurately portray and reflect the mission of Harvard Forest? Then we go talk to people at Harvard Forest. Okay, we're planning to do this. Does this work for you? Right, you get it. You know, what would you tweak on this sort of thing? Harvard Forest and, and people we work with can also help inform the content of certain pieces. Right? So this is this is a good example, right? There's this logging and working with chainsaws is one of the most dangerous professions in the world. Lots of people are killed by it, and there's a there's the classic um the classic widow-maker term, um, but then coming up with an image about this that combines the Harvard Forest, what we do with trees, with people walking and things like that, that helps drive the content. And then people push back and they say, hey, you know, it's not just guys, right? Because our staff forester at Harvard Forest is a woman. And so it could be a widower-maker, right? So we have both, right? So we were able to create both of these and respond to the community um, in, in creating content that goes as well. We want to reflect the material culture and the visual culture of the community. Harvard Forest really, if you come out and visit us in central Massachusetts, this is sort of iconic New England. We've got fields. We actually have a farm now. We graze cattle, right? So we have the Harvard Farm. It used to be a golf course. It's a much better use of a golf course, perhaps. Um, we have stone walls everywhere, right? We've got fallen trees. We have a sugar shack. We tap trees, 
right? We are actually, we have a group studying how climate change and reproductive phenology affects sugar production. Um, and then, so we're tapping the trees to get measures of sugar production, so you might as well turn it into sugar, maple syrup. We repurposed an old swimming pool shed um, for that purpose, and it's a nice wood-fired sugar shack. Um, so we want to reflect these sorts of, of cultural elements, and at the same time, we're a working forest, right? We have a sawmill, right? We cut wood. We heat 75,000 square feet with about 75 cords of wood a year in a community biomass plant that's sort of a model for, for regional New England. Um, we are active, and in our research, we actively work in the forest as well. And as researchers, we have a whole other set of materials we use, right? All the sort of things that you see when you do ecological experiments. You have sensors, you have wires, you have solar panels, you have all sorts of things that, that, that we put out into the woods to measure them. And then we're good New England Yankees, we never throw anything away, right? And some people call that recycling, other people call that eco-debris. Um, for an artist, this is a great sort of set of materials that we can use to reflect the culture, the material culture of the community um, in some of the pieces that we did. And so this then allows us to use different parts of the of materials that reflect the community so that when different community members are talking about this, we can talk about it in different ways and approach it in different ways. And so a good example of that um, is in this little piece from the, from the wayfinding barrier, from that first barrier. It's, we've got a heat lamp, which came from a warming experiment um, that we were doing, looking at how ants responded to warming. And the ants lived in these little nest boxes, right? So when I'm giving a tour of Hemlock Hospice, I can say, well, this is a really cool, you know, trail barrier. But, you know, this came from my project, and this came from my project, and we mark all the trees with um, forest safety yellow, um, and then this is a cutoff of, of wood, of hemlock wood from the sawmill. So if someone from the woods crew team is talking about this, they can say, you know, I cut that, right? That, that's my, my piece here. About 90% of the materials um, used in the exhibition, used in all the installation, are recycled or repurposed in this way. This is one of, one of my favorites. This is, this is a piece of our old sawmill. We have a new sawmill now, but this is from the old sawmill. So this blade is about 75 years old, and it's this big across, right? And so we repurposed it to do some, some painting and imagery of the, of the adelgid. We also like to think about how we express our values. And this, the, the Hemlock Memorial Shed, this is a, a, before we got it completely installed, has some of the different pieces in it. It's our, first off, it's like a three-dimensional diorama. It's out in the field. It's actually 10 feet. All right, we've got the hemlock, the hemlock um, stump in the middle of it. We didn't cut it. That was there all by itself. And one of the other pieces there, when we were putting all of this together, was that we have to respond to how Harvard Forest works. We placed this exhibition in the middle of the most heavily instrumented section of Harvard Forest, right in the middle of the hemlock forest that we're studying really, really, really intensively. And the scientists, myself included, say, you can put this here, but you can't mess anything up, right? So they're like logs that had fallen when this came apart, and they're like, well, you can't move the logs. You can't dig any soil. So everything just touches very lightly. We only use paint that's non-toxic. We only do different pieces so that it has as light a footprint as possible. We have worked with visitors, with student groups, with um, lay visitors, with researchers um, to develop programming around this that responds to the, the needs of different, different audiences. And we have both, we do both guided tours as well as self-guided tours. And we provide opportunities for interaction um, among people uh, who come to visit. And so this one, this is the exchange tree, um, the standard way that a hemlock falls down. Um, it, when, it, when it fractures, it sort of perches itself on its limbs. And we wanted to give people a way to respond to this. Um, and so we abstracted this. 
and then give people an opportunity to write messages about their response to the exhibition, to, uh, to the adelgid, to the trees, to what's going on in the forest, as a way to learn from the community and to have the community think about what this means. And at the same time, of course, we're scientists, and so we collect all those ribbons. We do this every quarter. We digitize all the messages, and we do text-based analyses, which then gives us new opportunities for research um, and thinking. And I will add as an aside here that this is not the real world word cloud, because I took out the most common thing that people write, which is simply their name. So 30%. 30% of the ribbons are just people writing their name, right? And so if I actually put that up there, like my name, right, then everything else would be about the size of, of geese up here, right? And the big, you know, Kilroy was here in the middle. And it's an, actually an interesting to think, thing to think about why that might be the case, right? But this does bring us into, the, into pieces of the exhibition that are really more tightly uh, linked to data, not so much the data that we collect as the data that we communicate, um, and about how the forest is actually, is actually changing as it goes. Um, and there, there are a few um, data visualization pieces that I'll highlight here. The first one um, is the, the double assault where we illustrate the combined effects of climate change and the adelgid on these, on these trees um, with two different saw blades. The trace here um, is the global temperature trace from 1880 at the beginning of the instrumental record to 2017, um, where we give both the data here, but we also introduce this uh, heat gradient of color um, from white through yellow, orange to red, um, indicating getting warmer, and we use this throughout the exhibition uh, and, in, and the different pieces to sort of amplify and illustrate the, the joint effects of warming on all of, the, uh, all of these things. And again, as I said, you know, we have lots of people uh, who helped these. So Jack Byers, for example, did most of the painting work. Salua was an undergraduate in our summer REU program um, who worked closely with David and I on design uh, and installation elements. This, is, this one is one of, my, one of my personal favorites. This is actually Salua's idea to have something about how the forest was the home for the Adelgid. So this is the, this is the, the Adelgid tent, and it's, it's up about 25 feet um, in the trees. Um, and there's some really uh, fun data visualization details in this. Um, there are silk screens of all the states in the eastern United States where the adelgid is currently found, sort of arrayed like if you were walking the AT or your favorite trail and you put the patches on your, on your jacket or on the tent. Um, for the botany geeks among us, it's got two white stripes underneath so that, because that's how you distinguish hemlock from some of our other uh, conifer trees are these two white stripes underneath it. It also provides us a prompt to talk about what we actually think about when we talk about invasive species, right? So we all hate invasive species, right? Everybody hates invasive species. And when you call something an invasive species, you are conferring agency on that object, on that species, right? If you look up invasive or invasion in the Oxford English Dictionary, this is an aggressive act, right? It's like, I'm coming in, I'm going to invade, right? Well, the Adelgid was not really interested in invading. The Adelgid happened to be on a potted plant that was brought from Osaka in 1951 into a, into a uh, horticulture operation in Virginia. It just showed up. It just crossed the border. And what do you do if you just show up? You like look for a place to sleep. You look for a place to eat. You look for a place to make things better for your offspring. And it found that in spades in Hemlock because we got lots of it. Right? And so it's just doing what any other organism is doing. Right? And just like we have empathy and consideration for human immigrants, legal or unintentional, maybe we should think about that with non-native species as well, especially when we bring them here. And especially, not particularly the Adelgid, but all the ones that we actually did bring here deliberately with all the best of intention kudzu, honeysuckle, um, autumn olive, the list is actually quite long. 
Here's another one that, that we like. Um, how many of you recognize this? You can, you can read, I'm sure, right? So one of the things that we get out of forests is we get information from tree cores, right? And so we abstracted a tree core into a USB drive. It's about this big. Um, we will make these on commission with your favorite tree. This particular one, these, these rings, uh, this, this set of, of rings is from a hemlock that was at the Arnold Arboretum on Hemlock Hill, which is no longer Hemlock Hill. It's like Birch Hill now. Um, because it was all falling apart because of the adelgid, and they cut it down now about 12 years ago. And we took sections from all of those trees so that we could study the, the climate history and the growth history of those trees. And then we took one of those and, and made it for, for our tree core here. Again, we've got the cutoffs, the forest safety yellow, um, and a way for people to play uh, in the forest with, with data. This particular one, um, is right at the middle of sort of ground zero of our, of our hemlock forest. We've got actually two towers here, um, two eddy covariance towers that have been measuring carbon uptake and carbon exchange between the forest and the atmosphere um, for the last 15 years. And we have sap flow sensors here that measure the change in water movement um, up the trees. This particular lifeline um, shows the actual sap flow of hemlock trees when I began an experiment in 2004 to look at the effect of hemlock decline um, on the forest. At the time, in 2004, the insect wasn't there yet. But we wanted to sort of proactively start thinking about this. So we went out to a, to a couple of hectares of forest. We have multiple plots. We took two of them where we were going to say, we're going to kill all these hemlocks standing in place just like the adelgid. We're pretty clever. You go out with a knife and a chainsaw and you girdle the trees. You cut a couple rings in it, slice through the xylem and the phloem, and the trees not surprisingly die. Um, and this is a trace of a controlled tree and one where we, we sliced it after, uh, over the course of, of eight days in 2004. And for me, this is really sort of the genesis of, of this project now looking back in hindsight. First off, we did this to 2,000 trees. Yeah. That's, that was exactly my response, and it's my experiment, all right? So first off, we did this to 2,000 trees, from little seedlings to really big ones, all right? Secondly, we did it to 2,000 trees in 45 minutes, all right? So two guys with chainsaws and knives girdled 2,000 trees in 45 minutes, all right? Which is incredible. And then I had that exact reaction. It's like, uh, what did I just do to these trees? And I go out and I look at this farce and that picture at the very beginning. These trees are all dead and falling apart. And I turned to some of my colleagues and I said, well, how do you feel about the fact that we're cutting down to, or killing 2,000 trees in the, in the morning? And they looked at me like, well, do you have two heads? This is what we do for a living. We're scientists. We study this. But we as scientists need to actually think a little bit more about what we're doing. And so this is really, I, de I designed this one as a prompt for my colleagues to think about what you do, because this, of course, runs out and it flatlines and the trees die after about a year and a half. And so getting people to think empathetically about what we do to, in forests and how forests are changing, and not just about the tree that's dying, but about the insect that is living and expanding, is also a key part of the, of the messaging here that, that we want to communicate. Um, this particular piece, the uh, the wood shoes, and is another interactive piece where we encourage people to like stand. You know, you want to walk in the foot the, in the shoes of somebody else. Well, we can't do that so well with trees, much less insects. But standing in one place and actually thinking about, you know, how would you see the forest if you could just stand here for 200, 300, 400 years is a is an interesting thing to do how we value the forest, how we value the trees. Most people, most people will think, when they think of trees, think of trees as resources. Whether it's resources for building or resources for woodworking or resources for bioenergy, it's a resource. It's not us, so it's a resource. As soon as you call something a resource, it's there for us to use or manage or do something with. When it's a tree, when it's got a name like eastern hemlock or tsuga canadensis or adelgis tsugai, 
Well, that's different. That's like now you're actually relating to it on a different level. So getting people to think about 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 that is a, is a useful thing to do. How we think about forests and trees dying as individuals is another big challenge for, for us to do uh, in general. This is the oldest and largest uh, hemlock that we have in, at Harvard Forest. It's about 250 years old, and if it lives another five years, I'll be delighted. Um, and of course, this is a global problem, and, and this is our visualization of the sixth extinction. We use, we maintain the iconography of the dying hemlock stands, and we had the preceding five extinctions, which were natural uh, caused uh, in some way or another, and then the most recent one uh, at our hands. So I want to wrap up um, with some comments that are really aimed more at people thinking about what's involved in doing art science communication in a project like this. Um, that to sort of, if you're thinking along the lines of how do I get the message out, if I want to work with artists or designers, some of these are particular issues in general. Some of these are bigger issues for, for science communication. I'm going to talk about most each of these in, in detail, working through a particular piece, the Fast Forward Futures piece. This is, this is about uh, 25 feet long, uh, sited in the forest. It's perched on four points um, so that it doesn't uh, impact the forest in any way. It's set up as a messaging. Um, it's like a fast forward button on a media player. Um, you've got our heat gradient. It points towards a black birch stand, which is, which is the next stage of this forest. First off, we did have these site constraints, right? We could only put it in certain places, and it couldn't do a lot of damage to the forest. Um, the, it's out in the middle of the woods, right? We got some little forest roads, but everything that we worked with had to, at best, fit in the back of a pickup truck a little Toyota pickup truck, right? And so each one of these pieces is eight feet long and, and weighs about 120 pounds, right? So all of those had to be trucked out individually um, and then sited in a way that didn't impact the site. You have to think about how these things work, right? This is not where we started. We actually thought about, well, let's, let's use the iconography of a New England picket fence and sort of Circum, cir, uh, what am I thinking here? Encircle the black birch stand as a way to, to do that. We put this out there and we looked at it and we said, that sucks. All right, take it away. All right? Um, and it went through a number of iterations until we came up with the final um, iteration. It takes resources, right? You got to have wood, you got to have paint, you got to have people. Um, I'm a scientist, David is a designer. Neither of us are painters, so we need painters, right? We have been accused of running an under-the-table artist-in-residence program at Harvard Forest where David would call up his friend the painter or the fabric stitcher or the, the person who's going to drill together, the screw together the, the memorial shed and say, okay, I'll feed you for eight days if you come and do this. And, and artists do this for each other, which is great. We talk different languages. In this case, David and I started pretty much on the same page, but a lot of times scientists and artists are not talking the same language. We do interact very well over models, right? I hand you something, he hands me something, um, and we can both look at it and walk it around it. And so, you know, most scientists think in terms of equations or, or hypotheses or maths. Um, and designers draw things, but we like doing models. So we actually built little tiny models of this um, before we moved it out in the field. And then, of course, you know, you cite it in different ways, and you look at it, and you say, well, this works, this doesn't work, I don't know what to do with it. Um, and, uh, and eventually, you, you know, you move through that, and you move on. Over, after you overcome these challenges, you have new opportunities to do new things, um, all of which, of course, present their own challenges. I won't talk much about community, but Harvard Forest is in the middle of nowhere, Massachusetts, right? And from the great numbers of you who have been out there, you can see, from my perspective, working 70 miles west of here, how hard it is to get someone out there to come look at it. 
And so we spent a lot of time actually getting the word out and doing the publicity. Now, this is a challenge. You've got to actually get people interested. And it's an opportunity because you get press and coverage and things like that. As a scientist, I will say that one of the most frustrating aspects of this project is that when I send things out to journalists, to writers, whatever, that the science journalists have not responded. We've gotten great hits from architects, 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 artists, designers, um, really weak from the science side. Although I will say, on the upside, Living on Earth came and interviewed us, and it will air this Saturday morning, finally. We are very excited about that. But otherwise, almost all of this is, is art-based and design-based, and we've been really pleased about that. Um, um, it's clearly something new and exciting for the art and design community. The scientists don't really know what to do with it, the science journalists. When I first sent a notice about this out to the National Science Journalist Listserv, the response I got, the first three responses I got was, is this about assisted suicide? Right? Why? Because there's a conflation there of eastern hemlock, the tree, and water hemlock, the little herb that Socrates ate to kill himself with, even though these things are about as related to each other as, I don't know, like a human and a fruit fly sort of thing. You'd think a science journalist would know better, right? Um, we... It is an opportunity for us to bring people out to the forest, either as groups or as individuals, and show them around, not just hemlock hospice, but about the, the forest in general. Um, and they can come out and do it uh, on their own as well. And this has brought whole new audiences. And we, of course, take data. We record, people record um, where they come from. We've had a couple of thousand visitors now out to this um, from zip codes who we haven't seen before at Harvard Park. So that's been really great. We don't talk about these things, you know, we, we harass people to get us to, to, you know, let us give talks and, and once you start doing that, then it, it, it does better. So in addition to sort of the local usual suspects, um, I've given talks about this in Ohio and, and as far away as Melbourne, Australia. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, we do satellite it. We did satellite installations to try and say, hey, you know, you see what you like here. This is how the National Park Service gets people out to the park. They put up a, a diorama or a small thing in a shop window, um, and they encourage people to come to the parks. And so we did the same thing at Montserrat College of Art. Um, we did a we did a pop up exhibition at RISD last year in in Rhode Island, um, and encouraged people to come to come that way. Which of course gave us new opportunities to do additional pieces. This is a a model of the piece that's going up. Uh, in Cambridge next week on the Science Center Plaza at Harvard. Um, and so on one side, it's going to have the global temperature trace. On the other side, um, it will have uh, different scenarios for carbon mitigation that people could actually do uh, to mitigate this trace. And this is going to be 30 feet long and 10 and a half feet high, and it'll be on campus from opening event is October 22nd, and it'll be up till November till December 7th, so please come visit. Um, I've seen, you know, this person taking pictures up front, which I hope you're putting on Twitter, but you can download all of them. You can download all of them for free from Harvard Forest's uh, photo shelter data archive and use them, right? These are they're all Creative Commons photographs. You're welcome to grab them and use them, and uh, we make this available to other people. And then it... it, it goes beyond that, so we have a group of researchers from UMass Boston who have been doing LIDAR scans at Harvard Forest to look at um, forest structure. Um, and they did a scan around the installation, and so this has given us a way to sort of create new visualizations about the project um, and create uh, new, new kinds of products. Um, of course, we're artists, we merchandise. If you're ever trying to do something like this, don't try and support it on merchandise. That just doesn't work. Just as a, as a ballpark, we estimate that the total budget for installing this um, from beginning to end was just about $150,000, right? Um, and a bunch of that was salary for the artist, but then there's materials and, and it just, and everything else uh, goes along with that. Um, 
And I would say on that, one of the, one of the things that I've learned in, through doing this and have become much more conscious of, as a scientist, as a staff scientist, I'm paid to sit and think. I'm paid to do the process of science. Artists are normally paid when they finish a piece, right? And, but if you really want to get an artist's attention and time to really enmesh him or herself in a community, so they can really develop something like this, you need to pay the artist for their time. They need to be paid for the process, just like a scientist needs to be paid for it, but for the process. Then it really works. Then you get the artist's full attention. One of the most salient critiques of the, of the project, both from ourselves and from others, is that it's art installation. What do you do with it? Right? And we don't quite know how to respond to that. I mean, we're trying with our warming warning installation to be more um, uh, upfront about direct action and what someone could do, but we don't actually have a what do you go do to save hemlocks out of this, recognizing that it's hospice. It's not about saving the hemlocks. It's about thinking about their passing and how we, how we deal with that. But in general, with environmental art and ecological art, thinking about how you translate the art into action um, remains a major, a major issue to grapple with. One of the things that, that, you know, David has done that we talked about in the beginning was how you think about these different scenarios for the future and how we can visualize those. But at the end of the day, we've come back to where we started with how science and artists interact, and we, I hope if there's one message I leave you with is that it doesn't work like this. Um, but that it really works more like this, right? That, that there's a constant interactive feedback um, between the artist, the scientist, the designer. It's not a one-way street if you're trying to do effective um, science communication and that there's a lot more communities and people and ideas involved than just sort of passing off that data to someone who you hope will interpret it. So I hope uh, this encourages you, if nothing else, to think about Hemlock in different ways, but also to please uh, come visit us or to join the conversation about this. So thank you very much. we got time for some questions, and I'm sure a little more pizza. Thank you, Aaron, for a wonderful talk. Questions? I was wondering if there is a survivability rate in areas that were originally affected and if there's any type of rebound in the of hemlock? ground zero. Yeah. Of hemlock? The, there's basically, I mean, basically there isn't. There are, there are pockets of hemlock that either the delegate hasn't gotten into yet or occasional trees that show resistance. And so, um, Evan Pracer's group, where Coco also worked down at the University of Rhode Island, has been working to breed resistant hemlocks. But much like breeding resistant chestnuts, right, we're going to have trees that we can plant out as specimen trees. But the idea that we're going to be able to replant 6, 000, 6 million square kilometers of hemlock is just, it's not happening. Right? And have any of you been to the Great Smoky Mountain National Park? in Tennessee. So the old growth grove there, the Joyce Kilmer Grove, um, is the quintessential holdup for the old growth hemlock um, in the world. And it's gone. Right? It was one of the early ones to be hit. But if you just drive the Blue Ridge Parkway um, up through Virginia and, and the Carolinas, it's just I mean, now it's recovering as rhododendron and tulip tree, but the hemlock is just gone. Just so. so, no, really. And, you know, there's, in, there's uh, insecticide control for specimen trees. You can use merit, um, which is a maticulprid, which is uh, a neonicotinoid class insecticide, which is the class of insecticides that has been banned in the European Union because it's killing all the bees. And so doing soil drenches or stem injections with that works really effectively. Um, it kills everything. It's an insecticide. It's not an adelgid, uh, hemlock woolly adelgid side.
Um, and uh, forest entomologists have been working on biocontrol, um, but the adelgids are a very interesting group of insects. They don't have any parasites or parasitoids. Um, it's one of few insect families like that, so the biocontrol attempts are with gen generalist beetles, um, which are even smaller than the adelgid, and about 50 million of them have been released, and there's been no tracking, but so far it seems ineffective. Go ahead. New menu. Um, what do you see the ecological effects being if the hemlock completely disappears? Like, what do the forests look like in 10 years? So, the forests in 10 years, in, in New England, the forests shift to black birch dominated with some red maple. Um, what I fondly refer to as New England blah wood. So, it basically looks like every other hardwood stand around here. Now, for many groups, birds, ants, salamanders, you have higher numbers of species in hardwood stands than you do in hemlock stands. There are certainly unique birds and spiders and insects that are unique to hemlock stands that go along with it. Um, but if you're just counting species, you do better without hemlocks than with hemlocks. But in terms of what we call landscape diversity or beta diversity, you basically go from a heterogeneous landscape to a homogeneous landscape. So, and there's a whole bunch of other knock-on effects that we could spend hours discussing. So. Um, you only mentioned this super briefly, but I've never heard the term greenwashing before. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little more about that. Who's heard greenwashing before? All right. Who wants to help her out? Exxon Mobil is a great example of greenwashing. Just look at any of their any of their ads. But it's basically using uh, environmental language to uh, hide evil. <laughs> there. Thank you for an excellent lecture. Um, when you first came to Harvard Forest, were you already thinking about communicating science and data accessibility through installations, or is that something that came to you uh, later on? So the, the installation part is new. The, the art and sculpture part is, is new, at least in the last four or five years. So, well, maybe about the last 10 years. Um, and, uh, but as, Practicing federally funded scientists, we always think about communicating science because we're required to as part of our of, as part of our grant. So that's been something I've been doing my whole career. But doing it this way is definitely new. It was it was actually it was sparked by a not this particular project, but the general theme was sparked by a, uh, an invite to give a talk, oh, 12 years ago at, at Boston University. I got invited by the studio art department to give a talk. And, and I said, so why do you want me to come talk to a studio art department? And the woman who invited me said, well, we have this series where we invite people in who aren't artists at Popwell. And I'm really interested in disturbance, and I was browsing the web, and I saw that you're a scientist who works on disturbance, and so I thought it would be really great to have you here. And I'm like, okay. And then I started thinking, I'll bet I think about disturbance really differently from how an artist might think about disturbance. And so that sort of got me into this thinking about how we can use um, visual art much more effectively to communicate scientific ideas. But it's been a, a career evolution, for sure. Um, I wish I'd come on it sooner. So fast forward 10, 20 years to whenever there's not enough hemlock to support the adelgids anymore. Do you see them dying out with the hemlock or jumping to the next available tree? So it certainly looks like they will die out with the hemlock. Um, they, they feed on western hemlock out in, in 
the North Pacific Northwest, where they've actually been established since the 1920s, um, and they don't have the same sort of heavy mortality effect. They also uh, feed on Carolina hemlock, which is an endemic in the in the Smoky Mountains. They've almost completely wiped that out. Um, as they as you move through, you lose the hemlock, you lose the adelgid. Hemlock. So then you go back to the biology of species. Hemlock doesn't seed bank. The seeds don't persist in the soil like birch or or maple. So they're, they're, the seed longevity is one to two years. And so since it takes about 10 years to up here, five to 10 years for the adelgid to kill the trees, that's long enough to exhaust the seed bank. So, um, you know, we'll have, I suspect we'll have scattered hemlock, but as a major component of our forests, probably not. Now, at the same time, this happened 5,000 years ago. Right, 50, 5,400 years ago, hemlock essentially disappeared throughout its entire range. Um, it was a kind. It appears to, as best we can tell from the fossil record and the paleo record, be a mix of a not of a native insect, an outbreak, the hemlock looper, which is a little geometric moth, so its larva exploded, and climate change because that was a period where it got warmer and drier, conditions that the hemlock didn't really like. And so if you look in pollen cores throughout the eastern United States, hemlock goes from 40% of the pollen that you find down to like 5% or less, which is just a catastrophic collapse. It came back. It took about 1,000 years, right? So maybe not 10 years from now, but maybe a thousand years from now, all other things being equal, we could have hemlock forests again. Now, we didn't have 14 million people in New England 5,000 5, years ago, right? We didn't have highways, we didn't have trains, we didn't have all of these things that will get in the way. To finish in a more, in a lighter note, can you talk a little bit about the process of creating one of these species? How do you come up with, with them? Do you have a concept and translate it, or do you start with the piece and try to find a meaning? I, I don't know. When, when, we, when we started this, you know, we had the idea that we would do something about this. And David had done some study drawings as part of his, his fellowship proposal. but. When we started um, really thinking about the, the pieces themselves, David, myself, and Salua, the, the student working with us last summer in May, we sat down, we said independently, we each came up with 15 ideas that we wanted to get across in the installation. And then we came together and we looked at our 15 ideas and some of them matched, some of them didn't match, and then we started thinking about, okay, how would you visualize that? How would you think about that? And it's just this iterative back and forth process. And no, a, every piece was different in that way. You know, some of them we had ideas for really early on, like I wanted the, the lifeline, the sap flow trace I had talked with David about early on, uh, and that had made it into his study drawing. But originally we were going to do it on mylar, um, sort of like Cristo and run it for about 100 meters through the forest so that you'd walk along past this declining, declining tree for, for 100 meters. And that was completely impractical. And it turned out that doing it with pine boards and a router and paint made more sense, right? Um, but, but lots of different, we were going to, we were going to use for initial signage. We were going to take the hemlock tower and we were going to light it up right, as sort of the entryway. But we don't have any power out there. So we can't light anything up, right? So there are all these little constraints. If we want power, it's got to be on a solar panel. You're in the middle of the forest. You don't get a lot of light. You can't dig anything. And so there was this constant iterative back and forth. I think it really helped that David comes from a background in graphic design because it adds a level of rigor to and iteration that, um, 
you might not get if you just said, oh, hey, I got this great idea for a piece. Let's do this. I mean, it's not a, it's not a Frank Geary building where you can say, oh, I don't really care how concrete behaves. I'm just going to do it. We're actually very, we had to work with the constraints of the site and the material and, and the budget. Let's thank him one more time. Absolutely.